Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to the Fall 2019 session of Applications of Deep Neural Networks. In this semester, I've just completed a major update to this course for Google TensorFlow 2.0 and Keras. TensorFlow 2.0, at this recording, which is in early August, or probably mid-August 2019, we're just about to get the Google official release for TensorFlow 2.0. However, it's not quite ready yet, so I'm going to standardize this course on TensorFlow 2.0 beta, beta zero to be exact. There's been alphas and other things before this. So I'll talk about that in a moment and we'll see what that looks like as far as our usage for this semester. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. You'll find most of the information about this course on my course website at Washington University. Just do a Google for Jeff Heaton and WUSTL and you will find that. You can also get to it through the Washington University Canvas system if you're a student. Most of the information that you'll want will come from the GitHub repository. This GitHub repository has all of the modules that we'll go through. There's 14 modules, each of which has five parts, and they're all contained here. They're Jupyter Notebooks, so you're able to look at them. Let's look at the overview that I'm talking about in this video. This is Module 1, Part 1. All of these modules will essentially have five parts. Each of the parts has a link to a video and also the notebook. So we're on part 1.1, one, one, so we're actually viewing the notebook. So if you click the notebook, it just takes you to right here. You can click on subsequent ones, and it will take you to each of those. Now, if you scroll down on the main GitHub repository, I show you all of the modules in one nice list. So you can see all 14 of them, the entire course, over the course of this semester. I give you a couple of links here, how to submit assignments, how to install TensorFlow, Keras, in Python and Mac. Now, you're going to do a lot with TensorFlow and Keras in this course. We're using the latest 2.0 of TensorFlow. It's currently in beta. It should be released sometime this semester. I was really expecting it to be released sometime in the summer of 2019 before my class actually started. That would have been nice, but that's not how Google decided to do things. So we've got a very established beta that we're using for this course. You can also use Google Colab. It doesn't have 2.0 yet, but I've made the course material so that probably 90% of it is compatible with Google Colab. I don't give you any assignments that are not compatible with Google Colab. So if you want to do the entire thing in Google Colab, you can certainly do that. And I have a link to how to make use of Google Colab here and it takes you through with a with the YouTube video. Another nice thing about Google Colab is it does have a GPU available to you. And a GPU, a graphics processing unit, that is something that can really speed up TensorFlow considerably. The course overview, I have an entire video that gives an overview of the class. If you just want a quick introduction to what we're going to talk about, essentially this class deals with the applications of deep neural networks, and I try to really focus on what makes deep neural networks different than other models. Deep neural networks can accept just about anything as input. Images, text, numbers, tabular data, sound. They can also produce just about anything as their output, and that's very different than a lot of the other machine learning models that you have out there. They can produce graphics, they can produce sound or text or tabular data. The assignments in this class We'll go through that now. This is always an important topic for a graded class, is what am I actually assessing you on? Class participation is 10%. That really deals with the four in-class meetings. If you don't make it to one or two or more of those, that will hurt this portion of your grade. I do take attendance during the in-class meetings. Class assignments, there are 10 small programming assignments. They're meant to be at least a little bit challenging for each week on the current material. They might take you an hour or two. Uh, it depends on how much prior programming knowledge you've dealt with. If you haven't dealt with Python all that much, these can be particularly challenging, and that's definitely one thing to consider with this course. This is a technical course, and programming is a part of it. If you haven't programmed in 10 years and you had only really programmed for one class 
those 10 years ago, this might be a challenging class and you you might want to rethink if you truly want to want to take the class because it's it's very much about programming. My goal is to get you to be able to program TensorFlow and Keras and have a good idea of really what you're what you're doing with that. There is a Kaggle project that's 20% of your grade. The Kaggle project really gives you a chance to try out your skills in machine learning and deep learning with your fellow students. Kaggle itself is competitive data science and it's all these projects that are put out there that the top data scientists in the world compete in. I create a Kaggle in class, which is a Kaggle that is not in the main Kaggle area. There's no money to be won for my Kaggle in class. It's usually just the students that compete in it, but sometimes others from the internet as well. Then the last two lines, the final presentation and the final project, these are both related to each other and you will potentially work in a team on these. So the last three are all group assignments. I'll let you form your own groups. The groups can go up to five people. We'll talk more about that when we meet in class for the first session. But this will be the group that you tackle the Kaggle with. Kaggles are very often done as team projects and I set the class up for that as well. The same team that you establish for Kaggle will be used for these last two assignments as well. The last two assignments, I will basically assign you a use case and you need to decide how you're going to deploy a deep learning or other type of machine learning model to solve that particular problem. So the last two are written, they're not technical in the sense that you're going to actually write code for them, but it does require a presentation that you will actually give during one of the weeks that we don't meet in class. So the weeks that we don't meet in class, there are Zoom meetings. I don't take attendance for these. It's not as, as formal as the in-class meeting. But during these, during the last, last part of the semester, you will present your final presentation. Now just as a bonus for those of you that do really, really good in the Kaggle competition, the top, the top team or two, I'll announce exactly how big of a group I'm making that when we get to the Kaggle assignment, but the top ranked students groups can choose to do your final presentation on your Kaggle uh, project. So that, that gives you an option there. And it's very interesting to see how the top performing Kaggle teams in the class actually went about the project. These are the weekly programming assignments that you'll have. Each of these tests you on your ability to carry out what was done in that module. I have a video on how to submit these. You actually submit them through a URL that I provide you and it's all automated. When you submit one of these, you're given an initial quick assessment by my automated system. This lets you prevent yourself from losing points for really simple errors. So if you don't have the number, right number of rows being generated or your data is the wrong shape or there's just obvious issues with this, the auto grader or the auto assessor will return a result and let you know about it. Now in the final grade that I give you truly the day after it's due when I go through all of these is done kind of through a combination of a program that I use to assess what you've written and also just me visually analyzing it. So one thing that I will say is very important in these, there is 2.5% of your grade basically for each of these 10. Don't let the due date pass and not submit at least something because you'll lose that entire 2.5 and you really can't do that too many times without severely affecting your grade. I give you sort of, and I'll put the exact rule rubric on there when we get to talking about these, but basically I hand out the points in sort of 0.5 increments. You get 0.5 just for submitting something. So believe me, submit something even if it's just the, just the template code because you'll get at least half a point for that. Then you get another half a point just for actually generating data sort of in the right format. Another half for is the, is the code and kind of up to the final 2.5 is, is the code actually correct? And however, I take off points for however not close you are to the answer for the particular assignment. I don't take off points for style or anything like that. So long as you're producing the correct results, that's all that really matters to me. As far as comments in your source code, believe me, the more comments you put in, if your program's not working 100%, then that's going to only help you in terms of the number of points that I give you. This is me, this is 
is in the Warshi Recording Studio, where a lot of the videos are put together. I am your instructor for the course. I have a master's in information management from Washington University. I also have a PhD in computer science from Nova Southeastern University. I teach really just this class in deep learning for Washington University. I'm not at all a full-time professor. I'm an adjunct here at WashU. My day job, my main job, is I am a vice president and data scientist at Reinsurance Group of America, also here in St. Louis. I do hire interns frequently for my group at RGA, so if you're interested in that, definitely drop me a line. I usually hire interns for the summer semester, but I often have openings throughout the year. We like for people to at least work 20 hours a week when it's not the summer semester, so you can talk to me about that. I'm a senior member of IEEE. That's my email address, and I've got some other life insurance industry certifications listed here. These are links to my various social media and other things. All the videos for this are put through my YouTube channel, so the class has a considerable following even outside of Washington University. You'll see the view counts and subscriber counts for my channel are well more than just the students from my physical classes. You can take this class completely, well you're not really taking the class, but you can read through and gain all of the knowledge from the class purely by looking at everything that's on the internet. Now you're not going to get your assignments graded or feedback directly from me. You can certainly leave comments in the YouTube comments and other areas, and I try to answer those as, as much as time permits. So the course resources, Google Colab, I will demonstrate that in class first night. Very powerful way to go about doing this without having to install a whole lot of software. We will use Python on Anaconda 3.7, Jupyter Notebooks, TensorFlow. We'll also make use of Kaggle for one of the assignments. And you're currently here, we're in the Git Hub repository. So what is deep learning? Deep learning, like most types of machine learning, if you're dealing with traditional software development, you give the input data and you write a program and the computer produces the output. Machine learning, you give your machine learning algorithm the input data and the expected output and the computer then generates the program code. Fundamentally, that's all a machine learning model really is, is programming code that the computer was able to automatically generate. Now the really powerful thing of deep learning is it can do the traditional tabular data where you have rows and columns coming in and it tries to predict one of the columns, but it also does quite a bit with computer vision and time series. The deep neural networks can input images and output images. They can do a variety of things. We'll see that the, the GANs, the generative adversarial neural networks, can even create fake images and other types of data. We'll see also that deep learning is very good for natural language processing. Regression and classification is how most predictive models really divide the world in terms of are you expecting a numeric output or a class output. Deep neural networks blend these all together in very bizarre ways. They can be both regression and classification or they can even be classification and return an, an image on top of everything else. So neural networks very much go beyond just the typical classification or regression that you saw in many other models. They can also do dimension reduction. We'll see how to do that. So they can do unsupervised as well as the supervised learning that classification or regression fall into. So neural networks, they have risen and fallen several times in popularity. There's a core group of about four people who really stuck through them and saw them through for the technology. Right now, neural networks are ultra hot. They are a very important part of machine learning and used in a variety of technologies. These three on the left were awarded the Turing Prize, which is sort of like the Nobel Prize of computer science. Their names are listed here in the order across. Jan LeCurn, Jeffrey Hinton, Yashua Bengio are really the core three, or at least the ones that were the winners of the Turing Prize. Andrew Ning, though, has had a tremendous amount of input into this and has created courses on deep learning. I consider all four of these the absolutely the luminaries of deep learning. There's others as well, but these were the pioneers. This is a diagram that's often quoted in deep learning from Andrew Ning. This is pretty typical of a lot of researchers. You will see deep learning or whatever the technology that they are promoting and then quote unquote older algorithms or legacy algorithms, meaning the stuff that is not what the researcher is interested in promoting. But I have found this to be somewhat true. If you do not have very much data, the older algorithms are usually going to outperform deep learning. Now I don't find it to be this aggressive of a curve. I mean, where does that, that they can't just shoot off to infinity. Where does that stop? So this 
shows you the takeaway from this diagram is unless you've got considerable data, deep learning is not necessarily going to outperform these older algorithms. And also, too, when you would use deep learning is that the type of data simply don't fit into the older algorithms. If you want to output an image or output text right from the model, then deep learning is probably the way to go. The convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks also give considerable power to what the deep neural networks can do. Recurrent are seeing a little bit of drop from favor. It's very much more about convolution neural networks these days. Now we're going to deal completely with the Python programming language. Other languages that are popular in data science are languages such as R. C++ is always huge because that's what TensorFlow and some of these others are written in. Now software installation. I have a whole video on this, so I'm not going to take you through too much of this. But these are the commands that you would go through to install TensorFlow and Keras onto your computer. I spend a lot of time each semester perfecting all of these commands so that it is up to date with everything. We are using the beta 1 of TensorFlow 2.0. This next semester almost certainly will be replaced with simply just installing TensorFlow because the latest version will be 2.0. Now I do recommend Anaconda Python because a lot of the numeric packages that you need for machine learning and data science are already built in and it's not that difficult to install them. So if you install Python just from scratch, that can be difficult. We'll use Jupyter Notebooks extensively. You can mix multimedia into the Jupyter Notebook, so I can mix links to my videos, I can do markdown, even LaTeX for the formulas. This bit of code that I give you here, once everything's installed, you'll want to run this and hopefully the output will be pretty similar. It'll tell you that it's TensorFlow 2.0. This will probably change. I'll show you that actually. So right here I am running, I'm not running anything, I'm in GitHub. If I go to this to a Jupyter Notebook running on my computer, I can now actually run this and it will show you essentially the output. So this matches really what you should be seeing for this semester. Beta 1, Keras version, the hyphen TF means it's the Keras built into TensorFlow, which is what we want to be using. No GPU available, but I'll show you in the Colab video, Google Colab, how you can flip that to the GPU being available. So this is an overview of the course. In the next video, we're going to see how to make use of Python for TensorFlow, Keras, and machine learning in general. Thank you for watching this video. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.